Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Tyrone back with Tech Life. And earlier today, John Stenke, the COO of AT&T, spoke at an investors conference where he was questioned about the T-Mobile and Sprint merger. So I wanted to touch on that. And then he also gave some very detailed info on AT&T's plans moving forward. So he was questioned about the T-Mobile and Sprint deal. And he said, no matter the outcome, they're going to face a distraction. So if the merger is unsuccessful, they're going to face a distraction because they're going to have to figure out a plan B. And it's funny that he said that because earlier in the trial this morning, they did announce both companies have no plan B if the merger is unsuccessful. Now, are they just saying that to get the merger to pass through? In my opinion, I'm sure they have some sort of plan B. I think the first plan B for both is business as usual. I don't think they change anything right off the back. They run business as usual. And then both, of course, are going to get in meetings and, you know, they're going to duke it out in those meetings as to how to continue. But he does say it's going to it's going to be a distraction. It's going to take time as to how they proceed short term, midterm and long term. And then he says, if successful, he says the integration process is more complex and harder than they make it seem. So that that in itself is a distraction as well. He's like, as they integrate, not just only the networks, but the, you know, the billing systems, um, it has been said for a while now, T-Mobile and Sprint, they don't, I mean, T-Mobile doesn't want to run two different billing systems. They just want to run one. Once you run multiple billing systems, it, be it becomes a problem. If you look at AT&T, they have multiple billing systems from the TV, the internet, the wireless. It's just a mess in there and their back end system is already outdated. So there's always price hikes, price increases, stuff being added to the bill. And it's just upsetting customers. So those, those two points that he made, if successful or unsuccessful, are both distractions nonetheless. No matter how you look at it, how you flip it. Those are going to be distractions. The the distraction on the if the if the merger is successful is of course better because that distraction means that there's ongoing enhancements to the network to of course boost the customer experience, roll out the capacity, and such. The unsuccessful distraction is probably not as good of a choice for them because they're probably going to have to look at you know how do we finance the five G. How do we do? Do we get a partnership in the future? Do we merge with somebody else? So those distractions, the, the successful one is a better distraction. But here, uh, you know, in two weeks, the trial is going to end on December 20th. And then, of course, in February, we're going to find out how the judge decides. So I wanted to share some of the, uh, the points that he's made about at t strategy. So his opening statement was... That, you know, it's good to see that it's not AT&T sitting on the in the federal courtroom this time around being distracted. He says that's a good point. So as the Sprint and T-Mobile are trying to close the merger, AT&T continues with their plan as planned. So they don't they're not making any changes to it or anything. They are, you know, fully committed to their rollout. So that includes AT&T's network. As most of you now know, AT&T has the first net contract and they're rolling that out at a furious pace. They are now a little bit above 75%, hoping that they can close the 80 percentile mark in Q1 of 2020. And then after that, the, that last stretch is going to be a bit harder to reach. But most are speculating around Q3, Q4 is when AT&T is going to hit 100% completion on the first net rollout. That is going to be big in the sense that, you know, they're going to hit more of the milestones to receive a reimbursement from the government. And that will in return lead to more spending on the network, of course. So that's one of the points that he's made They're um, They're also very confident right now in the uh, in the network itself. So he says, we believe our 5G e performance is on par or superior to anything anybody is going to turn up in the 5g environment in the near term he's not saying the midterm the long term he says in the near term their current lte advanced which we know 5g is lte advanced 
is performing on par with what everybody is, is, is rolling out right now. So that's a good point that he makes. That means they're very confident in the network at this point. Of course, there's still further enhancements that need to be made. I know some areas, you know, all carriers struggle in some parts of towns or cities. It's just the way it is. So an interesting point that he's making, and I wanted to uh, ask you guys about that if you feel the same. So they are saying in 2020, device upgrades plus bundling the HBO Max are going to be a main priority. And the reason he says that is because he references that the transition from 4G to 5G, he's calling it a major air interface transition, is going gonna, is gonna to be nothing that we've seen before. And it's going to entice and make customers feel more of a value to upgrade to 5G phones. Apple has said the same. Matter of fact, Apple has reduced their current iPhone 11 Pro Max by 25% production because they also feel that the 5G version is going to have the most impact and upgrade rates in a very long time for Apple. And AT&T has also now gotten on board with that same statistic. So 2020 seems to be the year where we, where we see huge upgrades for all carriers. And then AT&T bundling that up in May with HBO Max. With the capacity that they have, they feel very confident in and they think it's going to translate into a very, very positive user experience. Now, another thing that they mention, um, you know, there, there, there's an opportunity moving customers up into a higher tier unlimited plan with the added value, the 5G included, the HBO Max. So that that's their main driver in the ARPU increase. They're looking at getting customers into higher plans, which leads to higher priority, better network performance, and that'll bring lower churn over time. But another thing that he did mention, which I think is very interesting, is now since 2015, AT&T has slapped a lot of spectrum onto the network, which means in a lot of areas, they have high, high amounts of capacity. And that capacity, that capacity isn't easily filled by switchers and you know people porting in. So they are going to look at competing in the wholesale market, which they haven't done so, you know, ever, really. They haven't competed in the MVNO space. So in order to fill the capacity, they are going to look at competing in the wholesale market in 2020. So he made some uh, very, very, very big points. So I will leave this in the description down below for you guys to check out. I just wanted to give you guys like a main summary of everything. Um, at and is looking good right now. The stock's trending up. I know some people are saying it could be a potential sell because of the TV side, but that that's already peaking. There's just nothing at this point at and can do about it. If the customer's going to leave the TV side, they, they kind of just have to, you know, take that as they may. Keep the customers that are paying the higher ARPU on their plans and keep them happy. The other ones that are leaving and try to drive and grow the business through wireless. So let me know what you think about this in the comment section down below. If you're new to the channel, make sure you like, share, subscribe. Also hit the notification bell so you're notified when I upload content like this. Also follow all of the Tech Life social media outlets for more updates. This is Tyrone with Tech Life, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace.